you ever considered the industriousness and the determination of an ant colony? Have you ever looked up into the sky and seen a golden eagle soaring higher and higher and higher till it's just this little speck way up in the sky? Have you ever looked across the landscape of northern Arizona and thought to yourself, hmm, what can we learn from this land? Not just about the land around us, but about our planet and even the universe. Hi, I'm Billy Cardasco. I'm president and general manager of Babbitt Ranches. Since the early days, people have all been studying and learning about the lands around them. And they've had a sense of what it was to bridge the science and the art and culture of the times. I'd like to tell you three short stories about, uh, about, this, um, about science, art, and culture. To start with, pardon me, I uh, need to... I'd like to tell you about Isaac Cali Bynar. Isaac was a young man here in Flagstaff, and he had a deep passion for the small, vulnerable, and often overlooked and stepped on creatures. He had a fascination with ants. In his bedroom, Isaac had several ant colonies and ant farms. And he was very passionate about this. When Isaac's mom would come home from work, he would often want to tell her about some fun facts that he learned that day about ants. For example, mom, did you know that when ants leave their colony, they leave a chemical trail so that they know how to get back? Or sometimes they might not do that, but they might use a mountain or maybe the, the sun and the location of sun to do so. Sometimes he'd just keep studying and learning and then all of a sudden just pop out with something else for his mom. Like, did you know there are some ants that have two stomachs? They have one that's a private stomach and they have one that's a social stomach. The private stomach, of course, is so that they can stay alive and healthy. But the second stomach is held for a special one called repletes. And in particular, honeypot ants became a fascination of Isaac. These repletes, they hang from the ceiling at the bottom of the colony. And the worker ants come and what they do is, is they force feed them with the, the harvest of the day. Then they take that and make a nectar and they hang upside down at the bottom of the cave and underneath their, the bottom of the ant is this pouch that holds eventually what is honey. And I'll tell you, what I've heard about this is, is that it's delicious. I have not tried it, but there are <laughs> many folks who have. But it can also be a food source for things like coyotes and badgers and other animals as well. So Isaac says to his mom, you know, I really would like to have a honey pot ant farm in my bedroom for Christmas. Well, his mom is like, oh man, can't get that at the pet store. So she starts looking around, trying to imagine and think about where she could find some help on getting Isaac a queen. Right down the road at the Museum of Northern Arizona is one of the foremost knowledgeable ant biologists in the world. His name is Dr. Gary Alpert. He's retired from Harvard University and volunteers at the museum. Well, she visits with him, and coincidentally, he is taking a field trip out to Babbitt Ranches where they're going to do a dig for exactly that. They're going to go and find the honey pots, they're going to find the queen, and they're going to find the, the worker ants as well. He invited them along, and so they went, and they had a very successful day. As a matter of fact, they even got the queen. And at the end of the trip, he gave all of it to Isaac as a gift. Interesting about the queen, uh, the queen is not in charge. Uh, the worker ants are. She makes a lot of babies, but she is not in charge. She's also much bigger than the rest of the ants, as you can see here. Interestingly, ants play other kinds of roles in our life besides uh, in our bedrooms as an ant farm. Uh, you know, um, they have been uh, sacred in Native American cultures uh, for centuries. As a matter of fact, some tribes have clans that are specifically stewards of the ants. Some tribes believe that ants were the first creatures on earth. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the art side and all, it's kind of fun, but uh, Walt Disney, for example, has used ants as, as the friendly creatures oftentimes in some of their movies. And for children, sometimes their favorite toy is a stuffed ant. So this brings me to my second story. And if you take a look up from the ground and we start looking up into the sky and start talking about golden eagles, and one in particular named Yukon Charlie. Yukon Charlie is a golden eagle female that was around Babbitt Ranches several years ago, 
and we were very excited because she was in the middle of the seal bar north of Flagstaff, about 35 miles, and she was putting greenery in a nest site. So in other words, she was going and harvesting juniper and pinyon branches, maybe some twigs from the ground in other areas, and putting it in an established nest, but freshening it up. We were very excited. This means that she's probably going to breed, hopefully lay an egg, and then raise an eaglet. Well, interestingly, about Yukon Charlie is about the time we were as excited as we could be about it, she took off flying. And she flew, and she flew, and she flew, and we we're like, what is going on? And she kept flying north, and flying north, and flying north, eventually all the way to the Yukon. Oh, darn, we've been foiled on this one, because now instead of her breeding at Baton Ranches, she's gone all the way to the Yukon in a matter of a couple weeks. Well, anyway, guess what? About six months later, all of a sudden, we see that she is flying south and flying south and flying south, and we were so hopeful, and we started crossing our fingers, and yes, she showed right back up at this nest site on Babbitt's. So she went up there like a tourist, come back and started acting like she's gonna breed again. She started doing the same process over. She put greenery in the nest, she got it all, we saw her with a male, and all this excitement, Guess what she did this last summer? She took off again, and she went all the way back up to the Yukon. Now, here's how we know this. On the back of Charlie is a very small telemetry device. This telemetry device, as you can see in this photograph, is a solar panel on the outside, so it always has power. And then there's a transmitter, and then a GPS unit that collects data every about 15 minutes is collecting points from where she is, elevations as well as uh, ground hits and, uh, and location. When she flies over a cell tower, it automatically downloads. So as long as Charlie is in and around a cell tower, we're collecting this information. It goes to a company that takes it and applies it to Google Earth, and we are able to see all of the locations of these golden eagles. Interesting thing about golden eagles, their wingspans are wider than my arms. They are a big, big bird. And also what's interesting is, is the beak. Now, I, we've probably seen pictures of it, but to see it in real life, it is a strong, big beak, just ready to tear apart the carrion and different food sources that it gets. And its claws, oh my gosh, its talons are bigger than my hand and much, much more powerful. What we're learning from our um, studies is, is that Given climate variability and climate change, a lot of the habitat needs and are important to know what we should be doing from a management perspective. And we know there are nine territories in and around Babbitt Ranches. The nine golden eagle territories consist of about 64 golden eagle nests in and around Babbitt Ranches. And so uh, with that, what we've started to focus on is the prey base. Their number one prey base is rabbits. In particular, it can be cottontails and, and jackrabbits. But they'll feed on other things as well, for example, prairie dogs, as well as in the spring, maybe fawns of deer and antelope. But there's one more thing I need to tell you about eagles, and it is, is that, like all of us, when we go to a hotel or somewhere and we hear there's bed bugs, we kind of get spooked by that pretty good. Well, same thing happens for eagles. In their nests are bed bugs. And this is because they feed so much food in those nests and that when it's left over and they leave the nest, all these different bugs move in and you know, kind of try to keep it cleaned up and, and so on and so forth. Well, what happens is, is that when an eagle has an egg and it hatches, these bugs will attach to the babies. And then, of course, they drain them of their life. And so what we've done is, is hired specialists that rock climb these cliffs and they'll repel down the cliffs, and they will take some debris from the nest. They'll take a little twig and maybe some soil and some other things from the cracks and things around the nest, put it in a Ziploc baggie, and then go put it under microscopes. And that's how we know whether or not the, there's an infestation of these certain bugs. Someday we may be able to actually mitigate, uh, you know, appropriately be able to fumigate these nest sites so that we can help to um, support a successful um, hatch of, of the eagles. So. With that, I'd like to just mention also that eagles play a real big role culturally for all of us. And they play a, a big role in the arts as well. Um, everything from kachina dolls to paintings. Um, it's hard to drive by a library or 
you know, uh, some courthouse and not see a great big eagle, in particular maybe a golden eagle statue. And, um, and then of course with the photographs, for all of us we've seen the, the eagles uh, posters that say, you know, determination and courage, uh, industriousness and focus and things. So the golden eagles have played a big part in all of our lives one way or another. So if we take it just a little bit higher, and go from the eagles and we go into space a little bit, there are probably some of you here that are, know a lot about this, but in the 60s, northern Arizona was a big time playground for the Apollo missions. And in particular was Babbitt Ranches. They would tell everybody at Babbitt Ranches, we love the landscape here, Babbitt's. It looks like the moon. Well, now I don't know if that was a compliment for a ranch or not, <laughs> but at the same time, it provided some great opportunity for us to get to participate with some of the astronauts and the other engineers that are involved in the Apollo missions. Well, with the whole comment about the landscape, there was one thing missing in northern Arizona that they needed to have in order to have successful training missions, and that was craters. So what they did is they got a whole bunch of dynamite, and I think they got some of the Babbitt Ranch cowboys, and they got some others, and they went and made craters all over the place. And so there were some wide and some not so wide, some deeper than others. But what this allowed was the astronauts to go and practice collecting rocks and to practice walking but it also allowed them to practice driving their moon buggies. Now, if you all remember growing up and seeing those moon buggies, they were pretty cool. And so they would drive those around and practice and do all of their different things. Well, since those days, a lot of technology has caught up with them. Now, instead of a moon buggy, they're making RVs. What this does here is the next one to go, a model like this potentially will be going to Mars. And what it does is, is that they can drive this around where the limitation of the moon buggy they would have to drive out to their destination for research, then drive back home. They could have their dinner and go to bed. Get up the next morning, go do that again. What this will allow them to do is just to go out and start driving all around, and be able to stay where they are. If they find something really cool, they can get out, they can do it, they can come back inside and sleep and eat, do their things, keep driving on to their next location. This particular um, rover, the man in the, in the square with his uh, um, space suit on, actually just walks out the back end of this rover. It's all connected into the wall. So he just steps into his spacesuit, puts on the, the backpack, and so forth, and just goes on back, and he's ready to go. So they've come a long ways. One more thing about the science on Babbitt's with the Apollo missions and, and the rovers is taking us to rock varnish. Now rock varnish is a manganese iron oxide which we can find all over Earth. And so uh, it's not that it's, it's just a specific place on Babbitt's, but what they've used Babbitt's for is to come out and to harvest some of this rock varnish. It's a very thin layer. In this very thin layer are microorganisms in the crevices. These microorganisms, it's unknown whether they are there because of the rock varnish or if the rock varnish is really there because of the microorganisms. What's of interest here is, is that they have recently found some rock varnish on Mars. If it's the case that the rock varnish on Mars also has the same makeup, what is the potential that it has microorganisms or some organics living within that thin layer? So the next rovers that go up to Mars will actually have an instrument that will be able to pulverize that rock varnish. They will be able to harvest some of the powder, I'll call it, and detect whether or not it has these microorganisms in it. So on Babbitt's, and the studies they're using there may lead to finding some life on Mars. Interestingly, they did use the rovers on Babbitt's before they went to Mars, and it was really cool for me because I felt like I got to be in on a little secret. They, they told me that nobody could know that the rovers were on Babbitt's, and the reason they were testing their software and they didn't want it to be compromised by anybody knowing where the location was, but it was really cool to know that they were cruising around out on Babbitt's, and I tried to get a CO Bar brand that we put on our cattle on one of those rovers, but <laughs> it didn't go so well. They've also filmed the IMAX movie uh, for the Mars rover expeditions on Babbitt's, and so um, it's been a real honor to participate with the engineers uh, on all of that. Well, when it comes to the art and science of space, you know, I was uh, recently learning about 1938, the Orson Welles uh, War of the Worlds, um, I don't think anybody here heard that, but it did cause a lot of chaos in the country, uh, thinking aliens had, um, you know, come to Earth and were going to take over. But that's been a theme through all of our lives growing up and even today. I mean, it started with Lost in Space, and I'm sure some of you in here saw that show when you were younger and enjoyed it like I did. 
But then it went to Star Trek and then, of course, Star Wars and so many other movies and stuff. It's a big part of our lives, the culture of space. So, you know, with all of this being said, you know, those are all big things. But in the end, you know, it's these little things like the tiny ant that inspire um, that one small step off a lunar module onto the, plant, onto the moon, you know, to a paint stroke, one paint stroke that makes a, just the most beautiful painting, one carving of a knife, you know, on a root of cottonwood that makes the most beautiful golden eagle kachina doll. It could be just this little transmitter that goes on the back of a golden eagle and can tell us so much about the habitats of golden eagles and all of its prey base. I need to go back very quickly to the first story. Isaac passed away a year ago of a brain seizure. And anyway, in his memory, his family created the Isaac Ant Foundation. Along with the Museum of Northern Arizona and with the other scientists and researchers and others in the community, they have, are building an art exhibit uh, at the Museum of Northern Arizona, which will host a actual live ant colony and all of the information and uh, you know, cool facts about ants. So if you ever get a chance to go by the museum in the near future, there will be a terrific uh, exhibit there uh, in large part because of a passion of a young boy named Isaac. So with all of that, thank you. <laughs>